In this issue, we go to the 1987 IMAA Festival in Converse, Indiana. We have a review of the Acrostar from Golden Gate Hobbies. Jeff Troy is back and shows us the best way to use striping tape. We have a NASA film, The Model Builder. Doug Pratt shows us how to get a 100% charge for our electric projects. Ed Nagasone shows us a simple way to learn auto rotation. And finally, we have a report on this RC research plane called the Methane Hunter. Forty-seven years ago, this was a naval air base. Cadets trained here for aircraft carrier duty during World War II. Many pilots earned their wings flying Stearmans off this six-sided, 53-acre oasis of concrete in Converse, Indiana. This was a perfect location for the 1987 IMAA annual fly-in. International Miniature Aircraft Association promotes camaraderie and exchange of information. Its non-competitive nature means a fun annual festival. The IMAA was started only seven years ago and has grown to over 200 chapters worldwide. The first annual festival was held in 1981 in Louisville, Kentucky. This year, over 300 pilots have arrived. They've registered more than 500 large-scale aircraft. from Hilo, Hawaii, holding that pretty pink and maroon airplane. RC Video Magazine taking some pictures of him right now. And, uh Welcome to Converse, Indiana. I'm Gary Bussell, a CD of the 7th Annual IMAA Festival. We have 52 acres of concrete here, 500 airplanes, and four days of sunshine. We logged about 300 flights yesterday, and we're having a good time. <laughs> no trophies and no awards, just a good time. We've got a lot of aircraft to look at, so let's get started. This Byron F-15 was built by Merlin Graves of Downers Grove, Illinois. Merlin is a member of Chapter 28. His F-15 is powered by two OS-77 ducted fan engines, and we noticed he was flying with JR radio gear. Okay, we still got the, the other, other giant giant way out to the southeast, so he's out of our pattern. I think he's just coming over to what's going on. 
Merlin is having trouble with one retract and decides to set down the F-15 in the grass with landing gear retracted. This beautiful Stinson trimotor was built by Irvin Mount of Marion, Indiana. This is a large aircraft with a wingspan of 120 inches and a weight of 35 pounds. Irvin has powered his aircraft with three OS-4 stroke engines. This gives the Stinson a nice scale sound. This Byron Corsair caught our attention. It was built by Dean Hilbert of Newcastle, Indiana. Dean's plane weighs in at 24 pounds and is powered with a SAX 3.7. Here is Jack Treadman's Flybaby biplane from a Balsa USA kit. Jack built his plane way back in 1982. It's being pulled nicely through the air with a Quadra 50. The plane has a wingspan of 88 inches and weighs 29 pounds. Jack is from Batavia, Illinois. The builder and pilot of this Fokker F-27 is Art Schreider of Cleveland, Ohio. This plane clips along on two Super Tigers with tuned pipes. Big is better, all right. Look at this 29-pound Fokker DR1, built by John Beaker of Charlotte, North Carolina. John has installed a Quadra 50 for power. Walking along the flight line, we saw hundreds of large-scale aircraft waiting to fly. We're going to take a minute or two and look at the aircraft on the ground. See how many you can identify. Let's get back to the flying with Don Welsh on a takeoff roll.
This is a Tom Cook kit of the F4 Phantom. It's powered with two Rossi 65. This is Frank Knoll's Christian Eagle on takeoff roll. Saturday evening after the flight line closed, another line formed for the annual IMAA pig roast. Hi, Tom. Hi. Enjoying the flying? Oh, yeah. You go every year? Oh, yeah. Uh, what, what plane are you flying? I don't. I'm a manufacturer. What do you manufacture? TND fiberglass specialty. There's my pilot right here. What's your name? Bob Shadowroll. Um, are you enjoying the flying, Bob? Yes, I am. Second, second IMA festival, and this one has just been superb. Fantastic. How's this compared to some of the other fly-ins you go to? This is the biggest, the best attendance, and it's just a class affair. I'm, I'm really in love with this place. How's the pig roast, Bob? Hey, the pig roast is great. The, <laughs> the barbecue is just fine. I, baked potato, coleslaw, beans, couldn't be better. There were a number of exceptional pilots entertaining the spectators. This is Miles Reed flying his scratch-built week special. And now he's going to do a rolling circle, I would say. Up high, rolling the airplane continuously while he's doing a 360-degree circle. That takes coordination. Here is Bob Campbell doing his own style of touch and go with his Avant 1. This plane has a wingspan of 7 feet with a weight of 18 pounds. Jim Martin is from Vandalia, Ohio. His P-51 is from a modified Bud Nosen kit. It weighs in at a mere 24 pounds and flies beautifully on a Zenoa G-38 engine. Here, Jim Martin and his friend Frank Knoll fly some very nice formation.
this flying performance by Frank No got the crowd on its feet. Frank is from Kettering, Ohio. He's flying an extra 230, manufactured by AHS models. It's powered with a Zenoa 3.7, has 98 inches of wing, and weighs 22 pounds. In this program, we've only been able to show you a small portion of the excellent aircraft and the people that came to Converse, Indiana and the 1987 IMAA Festival. But before we leave the flight line, we'd like to show you a few more outstanding aircraft. The Stinson Reliant SR-9 was built by Gail Paxson of Salem, Ohio. With a wingspan of 10 and a half feet, this plane weighs 42 pounds is powered with a 4.1 Sachs Dolmer engine. A couple of the last aircraft flying late Sunday afternoon were these two JN4 Jennies. Both were powered with 90 four-stroke engines and made a nice picture against the Indiana sky. The gray one is being flown by Richard Metz of Taylorville, Indiana. And the yellow one is being flown by David Farnham of Waterford, Connecticut. Just a few hours later, everyone had left this vast expanse of concrete to the grasshoppers and sparrows. And they are only disturbed when a cross-country pilot sets down occasionally. Discover the high-flying freedom of the Electra. Nothing else in electric-powered RC even comes close to the Electra's simplicity, affordability, and performance. The ultimate RC change of pace. The latest advances in RC car technology, combined with years of Carl Goldberg's model design experience, has brought you the Electra. If you're ready for the most refreshing experience in RC, there's an Electra kit waiting for you at your dealers now. And let's hear it for freedom. RC Video Magazine's own Kevin Jones gives us a review on the Digicon Acrostar. The kit was supplied to us by Golden Gate Hobbies, an importer and distributor of many fine RC products. 
we laid out the parts of the kit, and Kevin gave us some of his thoughts upon looking at these parts for the first time. The foam core wings come pre-sheeted with the dihedral angles already machine sanded. The kit includes high quality ABS wheel pants that are molded in one piece. The Dural landing gear has pre-drilled holes to fit the fuselage and wheel pants. At first appearance, Kevin thought the finish on the fuselage was pretty rough and would take a lot of work to smooth out. However, he later found that the appearance was deceptive and that one coat of primer and a little sanding was enough to make it smooth. One of the nice features of the kit is that the wing trailing edges are already grooved and cut to fit the torque rods. The horizontal stabilizer and vertical stabilizer also have foam cores, keeping them lightweight. And as on the wings, the horizontal stab has pre-cut hinge slots. The rudder, Kevin noticed, is quite thick, which is similar to those molded into fiberglass pattern chips. Golden Gate Hobbies also supplied us with all the necessary hardware, which does not normally come with the kit. Kevin is an experienced model builder, and after only a few hours of work, the airplane is already shaping up. In order to fit the fin to the fuselage, Kevin followed the instruction book and simply wrapped some sandpaper around the fuselage and sanded the fin to shape. Kevin found that the only hinge slots in the kit that needed to be cut were in the rudder and vertical stabilizer, but these can easily be cut with a hinge slaughter. The wing was epoxied together and reinforced with the supplied fiberglass. Thanks to the pre-cut torque rod and hinge slots, installation of the ailerons and flaps is quite simple with an almost perfect fit. In the fuselage, there is only one former that must be glued in. However, it is already cut to shape and even has a groove to compensate for the fuselage seam. The former also has a hole pre-cut that snugly fits the MK fuel tank sold by Golden Gate Hobbies. Kevin has already installed one of the wheels and the wheel pants. It is a very simple process with the bolt that goes all the way through and a nut to hold it in place. The foam wheel rolls quite freely and there is absolutely no binding. The wheel pants will give the finished model a scale-like appearance. Kevin also notes that the wing bolt block fitted around the torque rods very well with a steel lock nut already installed. The fuselage has the holes for the wing dowels pre-drilled and a matching plywood former to align the dowels in the wing. The wooden dowels are covered with plastic caps for durability. Kevin has decided he is going to use the very powerful YS engine. The kit comes with Digicon engine mounting straps, which fit the YS perfectly. With very few hours of work on the airplane, Kevin has completed the kit. The radio has been installed and all of the controls work smoothly. The rudder control uses the Digicon pole pole hardware, which has one cable for each side of the rudder. It is a very tight and foolproof method of controlling the rudder, making it absolutely flutter free. The kit also includes spring landing gear for the tail wheel to absorb shock. This is a very nice feature, which is not included in many other kits. The model is painted with Pactra Formula U on top of one coat of Krylon primer. The wing and tail surfaces are covered with mono coat to keep the aircraft light. The model comes with a scale-like canopy, and Kevin added a scale pilot to give the aircraft an overall sense of realism. On the inside of the fuselage, there is ample room for all of the radio equipment. The receiver and battery are packed in foam to absorb vibration. With the Acrostar's thick wing, there is plenty of room for the aileron and flap servos as well.
The moment of truth has arrived, and Kevin took the completed Acro Star to the Boulder Flying Field. Kevin does not normally feel comfortable with tail draggers. However, he was surprised with how well the Acrostar handled. During takeoff, the plane tracked very well with little response to torque. Once in the air, the airplane leveled out with very few trim adjustments. can probably be better than that. The Acrostar handled like a sport plane with many of the characteristics of a good pattern ship. Kevin noted that the plane came in slightly underweight allowing the YS engine to pull it through the sky with authority. No problem with roll, right? With the flaps down, landing speed can be reduced dramatically. However, some down trim was needed to maintain level flight. Kevin has been modeling for many years and has built hundreds of models and feels the Acrostar is a high quality kit, easy for the experienced modeler to build and fun to fly. You asked for new problem-solving products and Loctite responded. Now we're proud to introduce new products specifically formulated for the hobbyist by one of the world's most respected companies, Loctite. Try our new line of products created for modelers by modelers and discover the difference. Guaranteed to outperform all the rest. Loctite hobby and craft products are available at quality hobby and craft shops everywhere.
Hello again. This issue we're going to talk about something very simple, very common in everybody's workshop, and uh, it's called striping tape. And there's a lot we can show you with this about very simple things like how to, how to make a nice, even, straight line and how to go simply around curves, getting the most effect without causing any puckering, any buckling of the tape. And it's really very simple. We're going to walk you through a couple procedures to do that. And first, I'd like to show you some examples of striping tape and the way it can be used. Later on, we're also going to show you some ways you shouldn't use it. And uh, one good example is like this door piece around here. We've used a black 16th of an inch stripe tape to simulate a door opening on this Eagle 63. It shows a very tight curve. This can only be done with the thinnest of the tapes. Then we're going to go to the front of the airplane and show you the curve around the, uh, the anti-glare panel here. That pretty much covers what has to be done. The next piece I'll show you is a sailplane wing. This is a Larry Jolly Meteor. And we've kept this very, very simple. This, we'll call this the simplicity effect. It's a white wing, entirely white on the uppers. We've used the top flight monocote platinum, metallic platinum on the bottom, because the, the dark color will contrast against the sky and keep the sailplane visible at altitude. So that's the practical reason for the light on the top and the dark on the bottom. At the trailing edge, we've just gone to three very simple color stripes at the back with a separation for the AMA number and a little curve trick on either side to break up the polyhedral joint, the tip, and the root. The same scheme is followed through on the tail. The entire fuselage is white. It's simple and very effective. The next airplane we'll show you is an electric sailplane called the Electrolyte. And here's where we can get into some of the tricks of striping tape. What you have is the monocote sky blue on the bottom and the white on the top. Separating the two colors is a simple 1 16th inch white pinstripe. But rather than use a white pinstripe or another colored pinstripe on top of the seam line, we've gone the thickness of the stripe, which is 1 16th of an inch, inside the blue. So what we're getting in effect is two stripes for the price of one. We've got the effect of the white and then what appears to be a blue trim stripe and a, and a white trim stripe and then the balance of the blue color on the bottom to finish it up. All we've done really is inset the white pin stripe one sixteenth of an inch away from the seam line and that gives us the effect of two stripes. Now what I'd like to explain to you about what not to do is taking a rather large quarter inch pin stripe or even a three thirty seconds or an eighth inch pin stripe and placing it directly over a color seam. What that's going to do, even though the workmanship underneath it may be flawless, it's going to let people think that you've cut a cockeyed line and now you have to use a big, fat, ugly trim stripe to hide that seam. You'll find it flows a lot nicer with a thin stripe. The little separation lets everybody know you didn't cut it sloppy and you cut it real pretty. While we're on the subject of cutting things nice and striping things nice, I'd like to tell you that no matter what you do for a finish, whether it's monocoat, silk and dope, silk span, mica film, the new Goldberg film, no matter what you use, it's only going to look as nice as the wood that's underneath it. That's where the covering begins. If you can run your hand over something and feel a little bump where a cap strip meets a sheet or where two sheets happen to butt join, when you cover, instead of hiding the, uh, the error in the workmanship of the wood, the covering will enhance the error. All it's going to do is pronounce that bump and make it much more noticeable. You'll find that as your wings get smoother, even one little bit of dust underneath the covering is, is going to become the eyesore. It's like the one cactus in the desert. It pays to use a tack cloth over everything, after, even after you vacuum the wing before you actually lay the covering down. This is the wing from the electric sailplane we just showed you. And this shows a simple three color scheme using the monocoat pink, monocoat white laid down over the pink and then we've we've taken the white and cut it away on the front leaving about one eighth of an inch from where the plum the metallic plum overlaps the white there is no white underneath the plum there is no pink underneath the white what we've done with the trim stripe was again using the same method i showed you before with the sixteenth of an inch spacing on the sixteenth of an inch tape 
we've used white over the plum and white over the pink. And what we have in effect is a very simple finish that's quite nice using the blend of the striping tape. The striping tape seems to wake it up. If we had put this on the seam, I don't think we'd have had the same effect. If you notice the lack of bubbles and wrinkles in the LSM, LSF emblem and the, uh, the way the lettering is applied in the flag, go back to video magazine number one and we'll show you how to use frisket paper to get these things done. And the last thing I'd like to show you to demonstrate these methods is an original sailplane we did not too long ago called the Stinger. And here we've got paint rather than a film covering. This is K&B Super Poxy, white and red on the bottom. Now this time we've done something a little different. Instead of applying a sixteenth of an inch white stripe over the red, we've taken a contrasting color in the dark blue and placed that over the white. Again, one sixteenth inch away from the seam line or the color line. This gives us a very nice overall three color effect, but looks like we have a double stripe instead of a single stripe right here. Um, now to demonstrate some of these techniques we've told you about, we're gonna go to the, uh, the electric sailplane here. This is a new Goldberg kit. It's an electric powered glider. And uh, we just incidentally did some test flights on this, a very, very nice airplane. And I covered this rather simply. I used the top flight silver on the bottom, the metallic uh, platinum on the top, and again, like we told you earlier with the Meteor, we've got metallic charcoal on the bottom surfaces of the sailplane to keep it visible at high altitude. The black or charcoal or even the platinum stand out real well against the sky. Hard to miss. Right now, there's no trim stripe on the airplane, so we're going to add some to it and wake it up. We've got the white here because I feel it's going to be the nicest contrast against these two colors. And we'll go right to the back and tack just a little bit of this down. Now many people will just go along the stripe line like this, pressing down a little bit as they go, and securing the tape to the side of the fuselage. What you'll get if you cover like that, or rather apply a stripe like that, is a very wavy, uneven line. I'm going to show you a real simple trick for getting this stuff on in a straight line. We're going to tack this down at the tra tail end of the fuselage. And we're using 16th of an inch tape, so I'm going to go away from the seam line or the color line 1 16th of an inch, just a little bit above over the darker color or the platinum. We'll tack that down. We'll unroll enough striping tape to cover the length of the fuselage and very carefully remove the, t the backing from the back of the striping tape. Don't go too fast or the striping tape uh, may break its backing here and you'll have to get under there with a knife and pull it off. You notice I'm holding the tape quite a distance away from the fuselage. And what we're going to do is gently apply some pressure to the end of the tape and pull it. We don't want to stretch it out of shape and distort it because it will narrow the thickness of the tape and you'll get it uneven. So we just pull enough pressure to keep it tight and keep the line straight, sort of like a plumb line. And very carefully, eyeballing the thickness, drop the tape in place. You can give it a very light pat every now, now and then just to make sure it's where you want it to be. A little more up here. And what we've really done is simply connected point A to point B with a straight pull. And as you let the tape settle down onto the fuselage, it's going to settle in a straight line. When the, when the tape is down on the airplane, if you were to take your thumb and run it along the tape to tack it down, as you get somewhere between halfway and two-thirds of the way up the fuselage, the tape will begin to gather because you're going to be stretching it up on itself and, and puckering it and causing a, a buckle and a build up of tape up here. So the way around that is to just take your finger every couple inches and gently press the tape into place. After that's done through the entire length, you can gently pat it down. And when that's done, take your thumb and then put it in place permanently. Now to go up in front around the corner here, We're going to remove a little more backing from the tape.
and pull on it, again gently, not to distort the tape, but we're going to follow it with a finger and press down on the tape very gently as we carefully pull the tape around the same curve line that we've used when we trimmed the upper and lower monocoque. And there it is. We wrap this around the bottom, give it a little tap again, and do the same for the other side. The back is simply cut off and tucked around the end, and there you have it. That's the straight line procedure around the curve procedure. We've showed you how to keep it off the seam line to make a more interesting effect, and it works. It works nicely and makes the airplane a little more interesting than a big, fat, hide the sloppy workmanship scene. And uh, if you don't think it's going to work, just remember, would I lie? Big Daniel RC Incorporated, maker of Nice Starter and other fine model accessories, introduces the definitive lighting system for the serious scale builder. McDaniel's Model 180. The heart of the McDaniel Model 180 is the digital proportional controller, which allows sequential operation of all lights by remote control. The Model 180 kit includes wingtip and tail navigation lights, landing lights, strobes, battery pack and charger, wiring, and complete instructions to configure the system for your model. The digital proportional controller connects to your receiver through standard servo connectors. This allows you to control operation of navigation lights, strobes, and landing lights from the transmitter. Give your scale model the competitive edge with a lighting system that puts you in control. The Model 180 and the Model 188 for helicopters from McDaniel RC Incorporated. The first powered, free-flying, controllable manned airplane was developed by the Wright brothers in 1903. We had become obsessed by the desire to fly freely for sustained periods of time. Thousands of designs for aircraft were built and tested around the world, but the final result for many was disaster. Wilbur and Orville Wright spent much of their time studying miniature wing or airfoil models in a primitive wind tunnel. Using cloth, wire, and wood, they constructed models of their first workable design, a double-wing glider, which they flew like a kite. This phase of their research proved effective. Their historic flight was achieved in part by the testing of models. Model testing grew to become a standard research tool for proving aerodynamic designs. Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia, pioneered model building, testing, and research in 1917. Langley became the first model building facility for wind tunnel research in America. Many of the same model building skills found then are used today. Yet in order to keep up with current advances in engineering, some phases of model production have become computerized. Increased model testing temperature ranges anywhere from minus 300 to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit and wind tunnel speeds well up to 30 times the speed of sound have created the need for new materials like exotic stainless steels, titanium, special combination materials and composites. Today, NASA Langley Research Center employs approximately 300 engineer technicians in model building and boasts over 30 wind tunnels and supplementary research facilities. A model begins with an engineer's concept that is fully translated onto paper by a model design engineer. The design engineer's specifications are relayed to a computer programmer who transfers the design on paper into a numerically controlled computer that plots precisely each tool path which will cut the model out of a square block of aluminum. Each pass of the cutting bit is controlled in its depth and span of cut. The engineering technician closely monitors the milling operation as the general shape of the model unfolds. When all cutting passes are made, the freshly cut form is pulled off the machine and passed on to the next phase of operations where it is checked for accuracy of milling. If the model passes the battery of measurements, holes are bored where needed to facilitate mounting later in the wind tunnel. The model is then cut out of its holding pieces. It is a skillful, steady hand that shapes the airfoil or wing section of the model. When the model is polished and it passes all final specification checks, it is ready for testing in the wind tunnel. Senior aerospace technologist Bernie Spencer. This is one model of a systematic series 
uh, that we're trying to develop for, for post-shuttle single stage to orbit application. Now in this particular series there are some 35 configurations. Uh, each of these uh, counting the time to program the ordnance, then the final hand finished product uh, probably is about 160 hours per, per model. Now a complicated model like Space Shuttle that has verbal remotely controlled surfaces, it can be as much as a thousand hours. From miniaturized general designs to fully detailed mock-ups, the combined model wind tunnel research facility at Langley provides us with an invaluable stepping stone to eventual full-scale development and testing. Try a gallon of SIG Champion fuel the next time you go to the field. SIG Champion model engine fuel has been a favorite with experienced flyers for almost 20 years. That's because quality is our number one priority. All SIG fuels are carefully blended with a mixture of Klotz Technoplate racing oil and pure AA castor oil for maximum engine protection. I'm Gary Gilbreth. I've been mixing fuel at SIGs here for over eight years now. Glenn Sig discovered over 20 years ago that using only the finest quality ingredients can guarantee a top performing fuel. For those of you who already have the fine Sig products, take the video tour of Sig and see what makes Sig unique in the model industry. Hi, I'm Doug Pratt and we're going to talk about electric flight for a little while. I've been doing electric flight for a long time, uh, six or seven years, and I've really enjoyed the heck out of it. I realize, though, that, a lot, that there are a lot of people out there who think that electric airplanes don't work. Well, frankly, it just ain't so. Electric airplanes do work. They have their same little quirks and, and things that you have to learn about them that gas models have to learn. And there's no arguing with the fact that an electric model does not have the same power to weight ratio as a gas model does. That doesn't mean that you can't really go out and enjoy the things and do a lot of things that you can do with gas models cheaper, quieter, and cleaner with electrics. I really love them. It's a, it's a different beast. It's very difficult to compare apples and oranges and gas models and electric models. If you're interested in getting into electric, uh, maybe we can give you a little basic information that'll help you get going. A lot of the problem that people have had with electric airplanes I can sum up in battery charging. Just like being able to tweak a needle valve on a gas model, being able to pack the best charge you can get into your battery packs and understanding how they work will make the difference between a really satisfying performance flight and one where the airplane just sort of sags around and barely misses the ground and the trees and the goalposts. So let's get into a few of these little tricks without further ado. Uh, You'll be dealing with two different sizes of batteries in electric flight. You'll be dealing with either 1,200 milliamp cells, which are commonly called sub-Cs, and this is what you'll see in all the RC car packs that are around, or 800 milliamp cells. The 800 milliamp cells obviously have a smaller capacity than the 1,200s, but they are substantially lighter. And the reason 800 milliamp cells have revolutionized electric flight is that a seven cell pack of 800 mil cells weighs less than a six cell pack of 1200s. I can take any, just about any electric airplane that I've ever seen and add a minute to its flight time by substituting a seven cell pack of 800 mil cells for a six cell pack of, of sub C's and maybe tinkering with the prop a little bit to absorb the power differently. So when you go into the hobby shop and pick up a charger, make sure that you get a charger that's capable of charging different physical sizes of cells, different capacities of cells. Now you're also going to be dealing with different numbers of cells in the pack. Six cells, seven cells, sometimes five, and in some cases, eight cells. Now a regular RC charger, something like this Astroflight unit here, which is one of the most popular chargers made, will have a timer on it. I'm sure you've seen these. They are all over the place, especially RC car users use par uh, chargers that are very similar. You crank this timer over to 15 minutes, plug in the pa battery pack, and go. This charger is designed for one major purpose, to avoid burning up the battery pack by overcharging it. If you start out with a pack that's absolutely flat, you plug it in, 
you set the current, you crank it up to 15 minutes, at the end of 15 minutes, it'll probably have about an 80% charge. Now, that won't destroy the battery pack, and it's perfectly all right for zooting an RC car around in the backyard. But for electric flight, you want to get as close to 100% as you possibly can. There are a couple of different techniques that I can show you to do, ways to do that. And they have to do with the way an RC, uh, a NICAD battery soaks up and delivers its power. As you're charging a NICAD battery, you're, you're punching power through it. When it reaches its capacity, it turns that power into heat because it has no place to go and no use for it. If we can detect that heat increase, we can stop the charge before the pack burns up. The first charger I ever saw that used the heat detection principle for fast charging was the RAM foolproof charger. Uh, these are the people with little badges that say, if all else fails, ram it. Anyhow, this is a very nice unit. I've used it extensively. In fact, I keep this unit, this uh, particular unit in my office. And if, I'm, uh, if I see that the weather looks real nice at about 10 o'clock in the morning, I start charging batteries. At noon, I'm gone. Three battery packs, about 45 minutes of flying, enough time to get back to the office before 1 o'clock, and it beats the heck out of dieting. So anyway, the RAM unit comes with a 12-volt input cord, which uh, uses a cigar lighter, which I prefer rather than the big alligator clamps that clamp onto your battery, because you can't hook one of these up backwards. It also comes with a cord to hook up to house current. Great feature, and it's an AC-DC charger. That means you don't have to have a 12-volt battery in your workshop to play with it. The output cord, this block here, is where the resistors are. That means all the hot stuff stays away from the transformer on the inside. The charger runs real cool, and it'll run all day. And it has two different output cords. You use this cord if you're charging six or seven cell packs of the big 1,200 milliamp cells. You use this, char this cord if you're charging five cell packs of 1,200s, or my favorite, seven cell packs of 800 mil cells. All you have to do with this charger is take this cord with this little copper plate on it. That's the heat detector. You rubber band that to your battery pack, like so. Connect up the appropriate charge cord. Push it a little red button on the side. The light lights up. Real complicated, right? When you push that button, you start a 12-minute timer. It's going to put the appropriate charge into that pack either for 12 minutes or until that heat detection element picks up 120 degrees. So if the, one of those cells in that battery pack is going into overcharge and warming up, it cuts off the charge. Now if you come back, I, I'll, I'll uh, just slap this thing on it and walk away from it. And when I come back, I'll feel the pack. If it's warm, it's charged. If it's not warm, I'll hit the button again because I know it can't overcharge it. Come back. If it's warm, good, we put the next one on. This is a very nice unit made by Ram Products. So I'm just going to set this off to the side, let it do its thing so that we'll have a fully charged pack to work with. And we'll talk about the other method of 100% peak charging your battery packs. If you were to put a voltmeter across the terminals of this battery pack and then connect the charger to it, you'd see the voltage of the pack rise. It rises and then it levels off. Then at 100% charge, it drops. The reason for this is at 100% charge, as you remember, these cells are building up heat. When they build up heat, they build up internal resistance. That resistance drops the voltage. If you had electronic circuitry of some sort to watch for that voltage drop, you'd have an automatic peak detector charger. Now, these chargers do exist, and I'll show you a couple of them in a minute. But in the meantime, you don't really need that circuitry if you've got a digital voltmeter. This Astro AC-DC auto charger which is one of my all-time favorites because it charges a lot of different cells. This is a beautiful setup. Connect the battery pack to it, and here I'm using a standard car battery pack. And you can dial in the current that you want and set the 15-minute timer. If you want to detect peak, you grab your little digital voltmeter and the appropriate leads. These are the standard sort of probes that come with, with every digital voltmeter made. You really need a digital voltmeter because you're going to be looking for a very, very small drop in voltage. Too small to really spot with a, a meter type voltmeter. Then you plug the probes into these convenient little terminals on the front. The pack voltage comes up and we can start charging, adjust our current, 
so that we start to get a better current flow out of the thing and we can watch the pack voltage change. Now, 15, as I said before, a 15 minute charge is going to put about an 80% charge into the pack. 80% is fine, but you want 100%. So when you come back after the 15 minute charge, you crank it up to about another five or six minutes and at that point, you start watching the digital voltmeter. If you see that voltage start to level off and drop, stop charging, you've got a fully charged pack. That's an excellent way to do it. And uh, this charger charges a whole lot of different sizes of cells. Since it has a current adjust on the front of it, you can charge a four cell receiver pack, 500, million, 500 mil re standard receiver pack with this charger very nicely. Of course, anytime you charge, anytime I charge, at any rate other than the one that comes the, with the charger that comes with the radio system, I like to have that voltmeter hooked up to it. If the voltage is dropping rather than rising, I know that I'm overcharging the cells and I stop doing it. Okay, we'll set this aside. Astro also makes another very, very versatile charger for electric flight purposes. That's the DC-DC supercharger. They call it a supercharger for a very good reason. This will charge anything. Throw the, switch, throw the switch down to the bottom and it'll charge a single cell. It'll charge a 200 milliamp cell, just adjust the current properly. Throw the switch up to the top, it'll charge a 30 cell battery pack. As you can see, it has the same output terminals. All you have to do is plug in your digital voltmeter and you can take that 12 cell pack in the Porter Field or a 20 cell pack in some sort of a pattern airplane or something like that, crank up the old charger and watch it work. And this is the best way that I know of to get an absolutely peak charge into a large electric-powered model airplane, something with a pack larger than eight cells. Now, I mentioned earlier that there are some chargers available that do detect peak so that you don't need a digital voltmeter. I have been tinkering with a couple of them just recently. Well, now that we've got a couple of battery packs charged up, maybe we should uh, take a quick break and do a little flying. I just happen to have my snark handy. This is the plane that lives in my office waiting for my lunch break. Uh, this was an extremely simple plane to put together, ready to fly. Like most of the RPM kits, you pull out the wing halves from the box, lick the t middle and stick them together and they glue, and uh, slap the tail on with a little epoxy. I put in a different, uh, the mo it does not come with a motor. Uh, you can use just about any standard 05 size motor with the plane. Uh, in fact, you could jerk one right out of an RC car, use the same RC car battery pack, the same charger you've been using. Don't use the same radio because you want a radio that's on aircraft frequencies. But the point is you can use a lot of your original equipment and get very successful flights out of this. Now, I installed a micro switch for motor control. Uh, and that, that's also a very simple setup. It's something that I prefer to do. You can, you can go with a solid state switch or one of the motor controllers or any, anything like that. but. All I do is take a micro switch bought at Radio Shack and glue it to the side of a servo so that when the servo arm turns around and hits the micro switch, it turns on. have also gotten a look at a couple of chargers from Roby just recently, and I am very impressed. When I went up to Bob Kopsky's electric competition in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, the Keystone RC Club's electric fly, I saw about 24 of these Roby Automax 21 chargers. This is a fantastic unit. It runs from 12 volts, 
It'll charge up to 20 cells. I'm sorry, 21 cells. It's effectively the same as the other peak detector charger in the way it works. You connect the batteries to the appropriate output terminals, select the amperage that you want on the meter, and then switch it on and forget it. When it sees that peak, it automatically shuts down to a trickle charge. So you come back, and if the, the meter is all the way back to zero, your battery pack is charged. It's that simple. However, this is a very expensive unit. Uh, they run over $100, right around $125. Uh, it's a very nice unit, and it's worth the money. But it is a little pricey, especially for people who are just flying with six and seven cell battery packs. This other Roby unit that I've looked at recently is also very impressive. Uh, this is the Automax 8. It will charge up to eight cells, and this is a good all-around charger if you want automatic charging. This has the strangest <laughs> charge cycle I have ever encountered in an electric char charger. It doesn't detect peak. It has a three-phase charge. The upshot of all this is you're going to come up with a battery pack that is nearly 100% charged, but you don't have to pay for the peak detection circuitry that's involved. So this charger is a great deal less expensive, and it'll charge up to eight cells, up to 1,200 milliamps in a cell. I find it a very versatile charger for this purpose. Now, any charger that you happen to have, as long as you can rig up a way to look at the pack voltage, you can use peak detection charging techniques with it. I have a little gizmo here that is a very simple way of doing that. I butchered a couple of the probes that came with my digital voltmeter by removing the probes on the end and putting a couple of connectors on it. One connector is female, plugs into the charger. The other connector is male, plugs into the battery pack. Bingo. You're now looking at the battery pack voltage. And as you charge, doesn't matter if your charger has battery, has voltmeter connections or not. As you charge, just walk, watch the pack voltage. When it peaks, cut off your charge. So now you know how to use that particular technique uh, as you prepare to fly electrics. Um, as you, you fly more and more of them, then you'll be able to justify the cost of a, of a charger that does this automatically for you. I have one because I'm an electric freak. And I hope that this has made this a little bit better, for, a little bit easier for you to get the kind of performance that you expect to be getting out of electric airplanes. Give it a try. Let me know what you think. Maybe we'll do some follow-ups later on. Zap! Works like magic! It's the first choice of amateur and professional hobbyists with products for every hobby material. Products like Zabagap, Slow Zap, Zap Lock, and many more. The Zap Total system outperforms all others. We know what you need because we're modelers ourselves. With Zap, you'll be amazed at what you can do. The Duraplane by Duracraft is a 20 to 40 size trainer aircraft. It requires a two or three channel radio. The Duraplane is simple and resilient. For more information,
an assistant here with me, Kevin Jones, uh, who's been flying for several years, but have always been afraid to actually perform the auto-rotation process. So with this, I'm going to utilize him just to demonstrate to you that auto-rotation is, in fact, simple <laughs> and fun to do. And Kevin, don't laugh about that. That's, that's the truth. But uh, to get the aircraft set up first, uh, uh, we have a radio that has a throttle hold, which allows you, once you flip the switch, it allows you to uh, this disengage your throttle from your collective pitch, thereby giving you an idle uh, configuration on the aircraft while still having uh, free reign on the collective itself. On this uh, aircraft here at the altitude in uh, Boulder, Colorado, we prefer to run approximately eight, plus eight degrees to about a minus two degrees. But we find that about a minus one degree is just about right. So the area that you're flying at will have a lot to do with it. Like at sea level, I'm sure, you, you probably be comfortable with maybe a minus three and maybe uh, even at, at a plus seven at some cases there. Uh, we need to determine again how much uh, pitch we have on the aircraft. So in doing so, what we need to do is, uh, the way I, I check this out is, Kevin, I run the aircraft just when she's just about getting to a hover, mm -hmm. then I'll hit my throttle hold and let the uh, blade dissipate speed for a while or energy, then give max pitch to see the air aircraft actually jumps off the ground. Okay. If it does, we know that the aircraft has sufficient amount of pitch in the uh, aircraft. So at this time, let's go ahead and check if we have sufficient amount of pitch. Okay. Uh, go ahead and rev it up. Just get it where it's getting light-footed on the ground there. It's, just it's a actually gonna get off the ground? Yeah, just, uh, just get it slightly off the ground if necessary, then hit your idle hold, okay? There you go, coming out. Okay, hit the idle hold. Hit the idle hole. There you go. Dissipating. Oh, there you go. Well, I found that uh, in many instances, uh, people are afraid where the aircraft uh, really gets close to the ground. And that's what auto rotation is all about. So in, in that regard, what uh, I've introduced is a backwards learning process. That is, we're going to start from the ground up and move in the higher direction. There because you can fly. You can fly good. It's just that you're afraid when it, the aircraft gets close to the ground without any power. So to do that, what we're going to do is uh, several exercises. Uh, it's going to be building up in steps. We're going to start at about two feet level, get in the hover, hit the throttle hold, okay, disengaging the collective, whereby I want, at that time, I want you to give max pitch and to your left, okay, because you still have tail rotor control in this uh, initial phase. We'll do that several times. The idea, the attempt here is for you to get the feel of the aircraft actually landing and how soft it is on the ground. Mm -hmm. Then we'll get it up about maybe five, uh, four to five feet there, do the same thing, Get the feel of the aircraft hitting the ground there. Okay. We'll do that until you feel comfortable, okay? Or until we run out of blades. Oh, right. <laughs> no, don't worry. We're going to save a lot of blades here. And the next, next thing is uh, we're going to get it up about maybe six foot high, just above our heads there, okay? And let, let it fall down again on the ground and recover by giving max pitch. This time you're going to kind of delay the process of in, uh, including pitch. Okay. Then the next, ex next one we're going to go up to about maybe uh, 10 to 12 feet high. And that's what we call the last uh, point, because from there, what I want you to do as you get up there in front of you is to cut the power, but this time hold, I mean, not cut the power, give throttle hold mm -hmm. and pull negative, okay, on your pitch. Okay. Now, as it passes in front of your eyes at, or at eye level, what you do is you increase your pitch, the same exercise we did at the two feet, four feet level there, okay? So the first exercise I want you to do, that's what we're going to do until you feel comfortable. Then we're going to take it up and actually do the auto rotation process. Okay. And you'll find that the auto rotation power off is much easier than the exercise we'll be doing here. Yeah, there you go. Face the helicopter in the direction of the wind. Okay. Get it up in the two feet hover. That's about right. Hold it steady. Give it a steady hover there. Okay, now try to hold the uh, throttle hold. Give the throttle hold and feel. There you go, pitch and left. Okay, now note how the aircraft just went to the right there. Uh -huh. That's why it's important to give left stick oh, at the same time because that's correct because okay. you still have uh, tail rotor power in there okay so try it again 
And you'll find that in the actual auto rotation, you don't have to worry about tail rotor because it, it's ineffective anyway. But for this, we need the uh, power in there. So again, remember, two feet hover. There you go. When you go to throttle hold, full pitch and to the left, okay? Throttle hold, full pitch and to the left. There you go. How about that? Okay, if you're comfortable now, we're going to go a little higher the next step. Let's okay. bring it out to, up to about an eye level. Four feet, five feet, however tall you are. Not four feet. <laughs> Remember, we're going to do the same thing again. Get it up, eye level, steady, throttle hold, and power again, okay? Or pitch and power, pitch and left. There you go. Good, good, good. So let's get it up a little higher. And uh, again, uh, the process, get it above your head, about maybe 10 foot or so. Then bring in, cut the uh, throttle hold, bring in a little negative, pass eye level, and do the same exercise that we did here. Okay. Okay, a little higher, you, you might get a little shook up. She might bounce, but get the feel for it. Okay. Go for it, guy. Steady and into the wind again. Don't forget that. Oh yes, looking real good. Okay. There you go. All right. Okay. So that's the point. You know, at least you've got enough energy in the blades, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, just to feel confident that the aircraft is really not falling down flat, but you still have sufficient amount of energy in the blade. Okay. Go ahead and do it again a couple of times. Like I indicated, this exercise is much, much more difficult than the actual auto rotation itself. If you want to go a little higher, that's good too now, okay? There you go. It's a comfortable range there. Throughout a whole pitch. Oh, right. Okay, don't worry about that, but at least you didn't ruin the aircraft. You got the feel for it, okay? Got How do you feel? You ready? Real good. Huh? Okay, let's do it. Okay. I'll Forget now. When you cut your power, keep it uh, in a slightly nose high attitude. When you cut nose the power, high? just a slight nose high attitude. Nose We've got one, about one degree in here. Don't forget to hold it all the way down negative okay. and get the feel for it. I will not talk you through it. I'm just going to tell you, okay, cut, and you're going you're gonna to be on your own, but you're going to feel it. It's going to be very comfortable. And don't forget, we just finished up the 12 foot, 10 foot uh, height. Mm -hmm. auto rotation but this time you're going to come with some slight forward speed so i want you to give a little flare keep holding the negative now oh, flare with cyclic yeah flare with cyclic keep your negative don't touch it until you slow the aircraft zero speed level off then increase your pitch okay and you'll find at this point it takes only about half a throttle half a pitch to uh, keep the actual uh, auto rotation process going okay okay you can do it try it so just keep in mind a little nose high attitude and go, okay? Everything checks out. Boy, it looks good. Take it around. There you go. Slow and easy. Yep. Wind is in the right direction there. Come back around again. There you go. Slow and easy. There you go. Okay, okay cut. Now negative. There you go. Slightly nose high. There you go. Looking good. Nah, no, so pitch. There we go. All right. Congratulations piece of again, cake. huh? Thanks, I tell you, it's a piece of cake for anything. Uh, like I said, just practice those exercises to build up your confidence. We'll do it all the time, and I know you could do it. I know you had it in you. Afraid of that for this long. I know. Well, that's the thing. I think if you out there have also practice the same exercise that Kevin has uh, demonstrated to you, that you also will build the confidence and uh, be able to do the auto rotation itself. So with that, all I can say is continue practicing this exercise, and don't forget, break a blade. Here it is, the Challenger, an Aristocraft high-tech digital proportional radio control system. One of the best values on the market. The Challenger transmitter is designed for ease of operation with a unique mar-resistant brushed gold finish. Some of the features on the transmitter are battery check button, RF output meter, elevator dual rate switch, and an elevator trim down mixing knob. As usually found in higher priced transmitters, the Challenger's open gimbal design gives you stick tension and travel adjustments, and all pin connectors are of high quality construction. 
there is an easy access rear panel for servo reversing, mixing control adjustments, and dual rate travel adjustments. Change frequencies in a snap with pop-in modules. And the Challenger 620 system includes high torque indirect drive servos. The Challenger system complies with the 1991 narrowband standards. You can find one of the best values on the market at your local hobby shop. Hi, my name is Kyle Kelly and I'm with RC Video Magazine and today we're standing in front of NCAR on a beautiful Boulder, Colorado day and I'm standing and talking with Pat Zimmerman who's a leading scientist here at NCAR and he's head of a project called Biosphere Atmosphere Interactions. Uh, Pat, can you tell us a little bit about NCAR and specifically your role in this project? Yes, um, NCAR is the National Center for Atmospheric Research. It's a private research institution that is uh, run by a consortium of universities. We get funding from the National Science Foundation with some supplemental funding from NASA and EPA and even some private corporations. We work on all different types of atmospheric research problems. For example, there's a large effort in global climate modeling so that we can predict the impact of greenhouse gases on future climate. Uh, my project is in the atmospheric chemistry division and in my particular project uh, we, we believe that the atmosphere was primarily produced through the activities of biological systems and that only by understanding trace gas emissions from biological systems will we be able to predict the impact of man-made emissions on changes in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is changing. I see. And we've heard rumor that you're using a radio-controlled airplane in this project? That's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, the airplane that you flew the other day was a modified Robin Hood 99. And uh, we're trying to use that as a sample platform for collecting vertical profiles of trace gases in the, in the lower atmosphere. We'll probably, uh, we try to get a profile from ground level or treetop level, clear up as high as we'll be able to see the airplane, and we'd like to be able to get 3,000 feet high. Oh my gosh, does, does this mean that we're going to take the airplane 3,000 feet high using binoculars to fly it? It may. It may require that. Um, uh, it's important to, to, a lot of our emissions come from 
trees and from uh, swamps and so forth, and it's very difficult to get an idea of, an accurate idea of the concentrations in the atmosphere if you're too close to the sources. In addition, if we can do a vertical profile, we can calculate a flux, the total magnitude of emissions, based on the gradient that we measure in the atmosphere. And uh, an RC airplane is really, uh, looks like an attractive platform. I see. Uh, could you tell us what led to an RC airplane versus other, uh, other ways of sampling the atmosphere? You'd mentioned earlier that you'd had some experience in full-size aircraft. Yeah, that's right. I st when I started in the, in the research business in about 1973, uh, my job was to run the instruments in a twin engine, uh, we called it a mix master, but it was a Cessna Skymaster. Uh -huh. And I had to sit backwards in small cramped quarters and try to map where we were going and run instruments at the same time as we were measuring, making measurements in places like Phoenix, Arizona at a thousand feet or so. I got so airsick. And it was 115 or 20 in the airplane that I figured there must be a better way. Uh, besides, it's expensive. It costs us $1,500 to $2,500 an hour to, to operate these aircraft. Uh, another alternative is a tethered balloon. Last mm -hmm. year we flew a tethered balloon in the Amazon. Uh, and we flew it up to 1,000 meters or so. Uh, the problems with that kind of a system is it's very difficult to put together logistically. It requires a, a crew of two, three, four people. It requires you to bring power in to run a big winch. It requires you sometimes to pour a concrete slab. And it requires a site that's fairly open, so mm -hmm. the size of two or three football fields, so the line won't get caught in trees. For some applications, it's very good, but an RC aircraft could really make a big contribution in, in, in that uh, type of a situation. I see. And the airplane that you're using is a? It's a Robin Hood uh, 99. Mm -hmm. It's been modified, so it's now got a wingspan that's uh, approximately two feet longer. We hope it will carry a payload. It weighs about 20 pounds now. Uh, we hope it will carry a payload of between 12 to 15 pounds, and uh, a lot of the construction work was done by Bill Dombrowski. Mm -hmm. Bill is a retired machinist. He used to work at NCAR, and he's been working on uh, model aircraft for, oh, I'd say probably the last 20 years. Uh, he's built some really beautiful large-scale helicopter models. and. Uh, and so he's really an ideal person to help make the modifications that we need in order to make this kind of a system work. I see. And obviously it will have some technical instrumentation that you don't find on many model airplanes out at the local field. Uh, do you have any telemetry or feedback on what the airplane is going to be doing? Yes. Uh, we'll have to transmit back parameters such as uh, relative humidity, temperature, pressure, uh, probably relative airspeed, and in addition, we hope to transmit back engine temperature and uh, RPMs and so forth, so that we can battery condition and so forth, so we can keep track of this system and we can make it operate in a simple, reliable way. It's, it's uh, our, the system that we'll put on it to collect air samples will be fairly expensive and we'd hate to lose it, so. We measure concentrations of compounds at the parts per trillion level. That would be like if you gave every person in the world $10 worth of pennies and then hunted for a particular penny. We're so oh my God. tiny, tiny uh, concentrations of contaminants can really ruin our system. And so all of that has to be tested and, and so forth. So I would say the time frame will be this fall before we get a working system. I see. And I hear that you're getting flying lessons. Is that true? That's right. You're providing the flying lessons. And, and so I guess we'll, we'll, you'll be responsible when I crash it. <laughs> we'll, we'll try to have a successful flight. I'm Actually, right now, uh, Pat's doing just fine. He's had about 30 seconds of stick time. He had his first dead stick. Uh, I guess I did the final landing on it. It's hard to crash an airplane from 300 feet in 30 seconds. So I guess it was successful. You know, I almost feel embarrassed because it, it's, it's, it's so much fun that it hardly feels like work. But, but yet, we've, I've been in this business for, uh, gosh, it's been 
13 years now, and, and I can see the utility of this type of a project, and I can see that more and more groups, NASA, uh, the California Air Resources Board, a number of people are using uh, RC-controlled airplanes to do real work. Neat. Well, great. Well, thanks for your time. Sure appreciate you coming out, and uh, we'll be looking forward to a successful flying. In Volume 10, Mr. Scale Dave Platt will be showing us a method for transferring scale markings. We'll have a review of two EZ kits, the Folkwolf and the P-51. We'll have flying footage and an inside report on this 385-pound B-29 Super Fortress. So be watching these and much more in Volume 10 of RC Video Magazine. <laughs>